Dr. James Mukey, ophthalmic surgeon, Australian of the Year, and founder and chair of Sight for All. Welcome. Thanks so much, Sophie. It's lovely to be with you this morning. Let's get straight into it, James. Uh, Dr. Mukey, can you tell us what drove you to become a doctor? There's no one specific thing that drove me to become a doctor. It was something that I knew I had inside me from the earliest days. Uh, so there was no one thing. My, my father wasn't a medical doctor. It just, I suppose, I had this inherent desire to want to help people. I also knew from an early age that, uh, as well as medicine, I wanted to specifically become a surgeon. Uh, and I loved using my hands to, to do fine work. And so uh, when I was in my early teens, I used to build models and model planes and World War II tanks and things like that. And so I just loved doing very, very fine work. So from the early days, I, I knew I wanted to do surgery and I also wanted to do fine surgery. The idea of microsurgery was something that really appealed to me. So in the course of um, your medical uh, career, you took some time off to, to travel overseas and work overseas. Can you tell us a bit about, about that experience, your experience as working as a volunteer doctor in Kenya? Sure, through medical school, I studied really, really hard. And in fact, towards the end of medical school, I was starting to get a bit weary of it. And it was quite, I felt I was quite one dimensional. I needed a creative outlet. So I actually started building, uh, designing and building furniture. And at one stage, I was actually seriously thinking of dropping out of, of medicine to do that, to follow a different career path. And uh, so during my, um, my internship, after I'd finished my medical school, uh, that idea of doing something different became even more pronounced because during the internship, I was um, dealing with patients who were uh, had chronic diseases that were mainly self-inflicted diseases such as type 2 diabetes and smoking related illnesses and it was frustrating me. I was feeling a little jaded. I was only able to relieve symptoms. Uh, I wasn't able to cure people and I, I really wanted something different. So i would had all those years of study during medical school. Um, the internship was, was pretty gruelling and you had these 34 hour shifts and then I had patients that I wasn't getting a lot of satisfaction from. I just wasn't able to really do the things I wanted to do. So I just needed to have a change. And that change came in the form of a year in Africa. And I'd actually uh, come across this little hospital in Kenya during my medical elective at the end of fifth year. And so during my internship, I wrote to the, the director of the hospital and I said, can I come and work at that hospital uh, as, a, as a voluntary doctor? And he said, yep. And so as soon as I finished my internship, I headed off to Kenya to work in this hospital. In central Kenya, it was at the foothills of the Aberdeen Mountains. Uh, the hospital was in a village called Tumu Tumu. And that was uh, a particularly special year for me. Taking that time out of uh, your, your career to do that work, that volunteer work, uh, I would imagine some people might have said, oh, you know, you need to stay on this treadmill and keep going with the, with the progress of your career. And it could have been risky to take that year off. Absolutely. In fact, almost everyone I spoke to said, don't get out of the system. If you get out of the system, you won't get back in. And uh, that was a little concerning, but I knew at the time I had this inkling that I wanted to do ophthalmology. I liked the idea of ophthalmic surgery being very fine surgery. I mentioned before that I loved working with my hands to do fine work. So this idea of doing ophthalmic surgery was, was extremely appealing. So I went and spoke to the director of the Department of Ophthalmology at the Royal Adelaide Hospital at the time. His name was Colin Moore. And uh, Colin was actually really embracing and, and he was the one person that said to me that if you want to do this, this is a fabulous idea. And he said that if there was yourself and someone who was at a similar, similar stage to you, I would choose you because you've gone and, and broadened your horizon. You'd done something different. You'd challenged yourself. And so uh, that was very much his advice. So. I went off uh, with his blessing. Uh, he knew I wanted to do ophthalmology and so I felt comfortable that I could leave the system and then when the time came that I might be able to get back into the system rather than being closed off. So uh, it was during that time in Africa, towards the end actually of my time there, I was actually in the operating theatre and there was a phone call and that was Colin saying that his, uh, he has the job for me. So that was a pretty exciting moment. And, and based on that, you know, I feel it's important to encourage my colleagues and certainly any of my, uh, my trainees that I'm involved in or medical students, I do encourage them to, to uh, extend themselves, to take the challenge because ultimately it uh, creates a far more 
interesting life and, and that's certainly what's happened to me. I think that time that I had in Africa really drove uh, for me a desire to pursue a career in public health. It was also a much more interesting year. You know, I mentioned before that my internship was really just dealing with uh, patients with chronic self-inflicted diseases and now for the first time I was actually dealing with patients who didn't have chronic self-inflicted diseases. In fact, I didn't see a single case of heart disease during my entire year. We didn't even need to bring out the ECG. The ECG machine actually didn't have any paper in it. And um, so we couldn't use it, but I didn't even need to use it that year. So the patients who I was treating mainly had uh, infectious diseases. There was a bit of trauma, uh, childbirth, of course, delivering babies was part of it. So it was uh, it reinvigorated for me, I love of medicine and I love then that I was able to cure people. And that really then just instilled a new um, lease of life in me to continue medicine rather than going down that pathway of, of uh, designing and building furniture. And not long after I'd arrived in Africa, I wanted to go and visit the gorillas uh, in Rwanda. And Rwanda is a landlocked country southwest of Kenya. And to get to Rwanda, I had to cross southern Uganda. And at the time, much of Uganda was still in civil war. Anyway, I made it to the southwest corner of the country and uh, I arrived at a village. Uh, and it was at this time that Idi Amin, the former you know, brutal uh, dictator of Uganda, was trying to re-enter the country. Uh, he'd been deposed from Uganda a few years before, but he'd sent an advance party of rebel soldiers who were paving the way for his return. And so when I arrived in southwest uh, Uganda, I just happened to arrive at a village at the very same time uh, that this group of men decided they were going to stop for the night on their pathway through uh, to try and take the country again. I was actually with a travelling companion at the time. He was a New Yorker who'd never left the country and uh, he was wanting to go and visit the gorillas because he'd just seen gorillas in the mist. So this was back in 1989. And uh, so I was with this guy, uh, his name was Mike, and uh, we set foot in this village. Uh, we'd heard that it was a, a beautiful village that the chief would welcome you in and you'd have this lovely experience. And uh, this was not the case when we arrived. In fact, the moment we arrived, we were surrounded by this group of men, this very ragtag group of men. They were uh, filthy and they were drunk and they were very, very menacing. And they tore apart our backpacks, they were looking for weapons and they found our binoculars. You know, we've been doing some sightseeing in the National Park the day before. And so when they found our binoculars, they accused us of being spies and they actually told us that they'd seen us spying on, on them. And uh, this was pretty confronting, of course. And then they marched us away at gunpoint and locked us in this ramshackle hut at the edge of the village. It was just a tiny little village with one dusty road in the middle. So they locked, locked us in this, uh, in this hut and before they left, they said, we'll let you stay here, but as long as you behave yourselves. So they, they left us in this hut and, and uh, Mike was freaking out. And I, I said, uh, I was trying to keep a cool head about this and said to uh, Mike, uh, I think this is a pretty, uh, a pretty dangerous situation we've landed ourselves in. Uh, I think we've got to get out of here somehow. So we, we broke out through the back of the hut and escaped into the, into the jungle behind. And this was literally just as night was beginning to fall and this jungle backed onto the National Park. And of course, a National Park at nightfall is not the place that you want to be at, uh, at, at feeding time. So uh, we, uh, we managed to scramble and, and eventually found a road and then started to, to take this road, you know, heading away from the village. And just at that time, we, uh, a car pulls up or a car passes and we, we wave the car down and we said uh, to the driver, we're wanting to head in this direction towards this particular village. Actually, we were going to visit the pygmies and we were trying to get to this village, which was about 30 kilometers away. And uh, they said, yes, yes, we're going to, to that village and, and jump in. And so we jumped in and, but of course, we made it to the next village and uh, we made it to safety. So. Uh, obviously, I survived the experience, but it was pretty confronting. And uh, you know, my year in Africa was full of confronting experiences. I um, also traversed an active civil war zone in Mozambique on the back of an armed convoy. I had uh, malaria twice and amoebic dysentery once. Um, the hospital where I was uh, 
working in Kenya at Tumia Tumia, the house where I was staying was robbed five times and each of the robberies, robberies were violent robberies and towards the end, after the last robbery, the only thing I had left uh, to my name was the dirty clothes in the bottom of the laundry basket after the final robbery. But you were able to, to rise to those challenges and find the resilience to keep going and how important was that for you to have that experience? So those experiences uh, were all pretty confronting and at the time I was in my early 20s and you know when you're in your early 20s you're invincible and I didn't realise that at the time, I, I actually didn't realise that um, perhaps these were you know, creating uh, what I felt may have been a, an element of post-traumatic stress disorder. I mean, you just uh, just were living this fabulous adventure and, and they were obviously creating great stories and great memories. So at the time, I, I didn't realise at all that, that uh, these experiences were um, helping to build my resilience. It was just for me, this one great adventure. And it wasn't until more recently that I looked back at those experiences and realised that they were building this inner strength. And I think, uh, to me, there's a number of really critical ele elements to, to building resilience, one of which is keeping a cool head. And, and uh, I, I remember back to those experiences, and particularly that experience when we were captured by the rebel soldiers and we were in that hut and this American guy was completely freaking out. And, and I was keeping a cool head, and, and I think a cool head is really the the first step in in building resilience you know when you're confronted with a a stressful experience rather than um, you know letting the emotional side of your brain take over you really need to to control that emotional brain and to give yourself time for your, for your thinking for your reasoning part of the brain to actually take control of the situation and guide you in the appropriate path so i think uh, most certainly those experiences that I had in Africa allowed me to, to develop that side of myself and that was just, for me uh, one step in building resilience and, and there are a number of other steps that uh, I believe are important in creating resilience. So James, you've had a remarkably successful career but many people who see successful people like you don't realise that, that people have had their own setbacks to deal with. Can you tell us about your own health challenges that you've had to manage? Absolutely. In fact, I've had quite a significant uh, health challenge that I've had to manage. Uh, something that crept up on me, it was something that uh, didn't happen suddenly. So it was a, a chronic neurological problem that I inherited from my father. It's called focal dystonia. And basically it, it started to impair my, the function of my dominant right hand. And I, I first noticed it really in, in the late 2000s, I was starting to have some difficulty writing with my right hand. I was holding the, the pen very tightly and, and that was also, um, uh, I was aware of it when I was performing surgery as well. I found that I was holding the instruments with my right hand really, really quite strongly. And what would happen is that I would get a cramping in my hand and I have to have regular breaks during either writing or, or when I'm performing surgery. So by the end of a, a, a long surgical list, my hand was really quite sore. It wasn't actually impairing my, um, ability to operate and so uh, but it was it was worrying me and it wasn't until 2012 that I actually uh, had a diagnosis and, and it's called focal dystonia basically focal dystonia when when the brain tells a given muscle to contract it actually simultaneously silences opposing muscles and so focal dystonia interferes with the ability of the uh, the brain to do this and the best example I could give you is that if I held a champagne glass these days with my right hand I'd, I'd smash it but yeah no, it was something that slowly crept up on me and um, there as the condition progressed from being having no idea what the problem was to being aware of what the problem was to ultimately having to give up surgery in 2013 there are a number of steps and strategies I took. You know, some of them were subconscious, others I actively um, thought about in order to deal with the progressive uh, degenerative process, the progression of the dysfunction in my right hand. And uh, one of the um, things I did oh, way back before I uh, was aware of a problem was starting to, to use acronyms and hieroglyphs to, to document in my patient's case notes. And, and then when, it was becoming such a problem with my writing, I then started using my left hand to write. I started going cold turkey. I was cutting myself shaving with my um, razor, so I bought myself an electric 
razor and I started using that then with my left hand and equally with a toothbrush and I was slowly um, kind of coming up with these micro innovations to, to deal with the challenges that I was facing with my, my right hand function. So it was something that, that was, um, you know, as I said, slowly progressive and I was able to uh, implement strategies to deal with those little challenges that I was being faced uh, with, with my hand function deteriorating. So what that made me realize in addition to what I mentioned before about keeping a cool head, you know, when I was having those very confronting experiences in Africa, was um, as well as keeping a cool head, you know, particularly as I was faced with the, the end of my surgical career and ultimately the end of my medical career, was to keep a cool head, but also to come up with strategies, innovative strategies to uh, get around the problem. So is that how you coped with having to give up um, what you had loved doing, surgery, by, by putting those strategies in place? Exactly. So once you've um, faced with a challenge or an unexpected change in your life or a, an adverse experience or even a calamity, you know, the first thing to do is really just stop, take a few deep breaths, take stock of the situation, don't let the emotional brain take over and start to think rationally about you know, what the best approach is. And once you've done that, you can start to, to tell yourself, you know, I'm going to get through this. Or if it's, if it's a group situation, we're going to get through this. And, and I know at the moment, Scott Morrison, you know, you hear him a lot on TV saying, we are going to get through this. And it's true. Once you can take that approach, um, then it allows you to think more clearly about, you know, where, what the next step is. So having a, a positive mindset, a positive approach, with a cool head and then allows you to say, okay, we are going to get through this. How are we going to get through this? And that's when you start to come up with the innovative solutions to the dilemma that you're in. So uh, a positive, a positive mindset, as I mentioned, is, is really critical. Uh, you know, don't let it get you down. <coughs> Excuse me. Don't let it get you down. Um, but how does one start to, to build a, a positive mindset? And I think there are a number of elements here that, that are really critical. And uh, I think uh, just to list them off, uh, having good health and, and having a good night's sleep. You know, we all know when we have a bad night's sleep, you don't cope with things so well. So having good health is, is obviously critical uh, and that's not something you can address suddenly, but uh, I think just in general, keeping good health, uh, good diet and exercising is really important just to maintain that, that healthy outlook. So uh, a good night's sleep, and having uh, good friends, so surrounding yourself with positive people, uh, having those wonderful connections, so when times are tough, you can call on, on people when, when uh, things are down. Uh, and the final piece of that jigsaw is, is having a good habits. I think it's a really important part of this as well, which is, um, is uh, exercising your brain. What is exercising your body? Exercising the brain to have and develop a more positive mindset. And this is something we call neuroplasticity. And again, it's based in evidence that, um, that repetitive behaviors can actually start to change the way our brains work and particularly the emotional part of our brains. And so there are, <coughs> excuse me, there are a number of things that you can do to start to remodel the brain in a more positive uh, approach. And one of the things that I've started doing recently is when I wake up in the morning and then before I get out of bed, before I go to the computer or my, my uh, smartphone screen, I just lie there and think of what have I got to look forward to today? What are three things that, that um, I have to look forward to today? And at the end of the day, before I uh, close, well, once I'm in bed and the lights are out, I just think back on my day and what three things that have uh, been fantastic that have happened to me during the day. What three things uh, have I to be grateful about? What three things that I have achieved that I can be happy about? So, and if you do this on a daily basis, you do start to remodel the brain and your emotional connections in this positive direction. So I think that's certainly for me a great way of dealing with um, stressful situations. So just coming back to, to uh, my experience in Africa, which made me realize that, that keeping a cool head is, is an important starting point and then building on that a positive approach and the mechanisms to build that positive mindset and then that ultimately then drives uh, the ability to innovate and to come up with ideas to deal with the situation that you find yourself in and that 
then creates resilience and even beyond resilience, the ability to thrive in a, in a difficult situation. And we certainly see a lot of that happening at the moment. Yes, look, there would be many doctors at the moment who are facing a lot of stress, particularly with the COVID-19 situation that they're dealing with. What advice would you have for those doctors, particularly uh, younger doctors who might be at the, at the forefront of dealing with patients with COVID-19? Absolutely. I'm, I'm still practicing as uh, an ophthalmologist at the moment, uh, and we have set up mechanisms in the practice to try and minimise the risk, both to the patients and also to ourselves. I haven't been working on the front line, and I know a number of my colleagues are working on the front line, and it must be a terribly stressful situation. And I think the advice that I would give to them is, uh, well, I mentioned before about keeping a cool head, um, not let the stress of the situation uh, overwhelm you, not let the emotional part of the brain take over uh, your rational thinking during this time, not let uh, that stressful situation drive you in a direction to, you know, to, to have that extra drink or to, to eat unhealthily or to, you know, even potentially use drugs uh, or, or other things to, to make you feel better. What you can do when you're faced with this stressful situation is, as I mentioned, take a, a number of deep breaths and, and give yourself that time to, to reset um, set the brain. Uh, Selena Bartlett, who's a neuroscientist, uh, talks about adopting the, uh, the superhero pose where you just puff your chest out, put your arms uh, and your fists on your waist and and adopt that superhero pose just for a few minutes to to help you to rejig and uh, to start to, to get a cool head so i think that's really important and, and absolutely at the moment um, people working on the front line should be um, uh, trying to get as a good night's sleep as possible surrounding themselves with with uh, people who have a positive approach trying to avoid toxic and negative people that does undermine your ability to keep that focus and to keep that positive mindset. I think, you know, I mentioned one of these good habits was just simply to do a good deed. And what I've been doing a bit of recently is calling up my friends, colleagues who I know are in a difficult situation and just reaching out to them and saying, you know, is everything okay? Is there anything I can do? You know, that, that also helps to build that uh, positivity within you and, and definitely exercising in, in a positive way, um, uh, going for a lovely walk somewhere somewhere that is going to get your mind off what you've been doing during the day uh, or prepare you to say if you walk in the morning to prepare you for the day ahead to start to prepare you that positive mindset but just a few of the the things that you can do and and at the end of the day rather than having that extra drink of alcohol uh, pop some fabulous music on or, or watch comedy uh, we've been watching episodes of Seinfeld every night and and just uh, 30 years later it still makes us laugh and uh, again it starts to build that positivity so keeping this positive approach is really critical at this time. Yeah and recognizing that there are things that you can do that will make a difference as well even those small practices like gratitude or um, you know watching some comedy or just taking I think sometimes people think it's an all or nothing approach that you have to be you know meditating for an hour but actually those small things that you mentioned can actually make a huge difference, can't they? Absolutely, and just, just stopping for a moment and just taking stock and, and you know, this mindfulness that uh, people talk about, it's just a matter of being aware of the moment and, and uh, just having that, that time just to, uh, just to re reboot yourself, I suppose, is a good term. Uh, and, and also, um, you know, I mentioned before this, this uh, critical element of innovation and innovation does come in handy at this time as well. And even for doctors on the front line, just come up with strategies to, to minimise the risk uh, to themselves and to their patients. And at the end of the day, looking back over the day and saying, yeah, this, is, this has actually been a good day. I've managed to uh, uh, look after this many people and they're doing really well. And, and this is, I think, a really important way to, to, to address it as well. And self-compassion is a big part of it as well. Just like what you mentioned, that, 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 that feeling of saying to yourself, you know, I did a good thing today by looking after somebody and, um, and being compassionate to yourself as well as to the people around you. Absolutely being compassionate to yourself as well as the people around you. Being, being compassionate to yourself, I think, is the first step. You know, if you're not compassionate to yourself, it's hard to then reach out to other people to be compassionate. So that compassion factor is, is a, a really important part of this. So, James, how important is it, do you think, that doctors find their passion and a sense of purpose so that they can 
really reach their potential. I think it's very important for anyone to find their passion because I think ultimately for me, the passions and the results of harnessing those passions. And for me, it's been, uh, I mentioned before about social entrepreneurship, it's allowed me to harness the passion that I've had, which has been, uh, which has arisen from some of the pretty confronting experiences that I've had and allowed me then to uh, use that passion and create skills to, uh, to, dr to drive it in a positive way. So passions can sometimes, uh, as a result of confronting experiences drive you in, a, in, a, in a, a negative way, I suppose, and to harness those passions to drive you in a positive way and ultimately to, to make a difference and, and to make a difference within your uh, own life, to make a difference within your career, your family life, or ultimately on a larger scale. And, and that for me has been one of the, the joys of my life uh, is to use my passion to create site for all, to grow site for all, and the benefits of uh, the things that we've achieved with site for all, we're now impacting on close to, if not uh, significantly more than a million people every year in a number of countries uh, in Asia and Africa. And that seeing the result of what my passion has created, again, gives us that fabulous positive feedback to, to um, help build that resilient nature and to help you cope with the tough things that are happening in your life. So uh, I think it's really important for people, if they have a passion, uh, not, to, not to put that passion on the back burner, keep that passion burning away. And, and certainly for me, uh, I had my clinical job and my uh, site floor job, which I call my second full-time job. I put uh, as many hours into that as I do in my clinical job, but it's allowed me to, 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 uh, to have my passions and to allow those passions to, to become a very important part of my life. So James, you're Australian of the Year. Um, what does that honour mean to you and what message would you like to get out to all Australians now that you have this, this platform? Being awarded Australian of the Year uh, back on Australia Day long weekend, which uh, seems like a long time ago now, was a, it was a very, very special moment. Uh, I was not expecting to win. Uh, Australian of the Year last year, Richard Harris was an Adelaide doctor, and I didn't think that they were going to give it to another Adelaide doctor this year. So when my name was called, it was uh, it was an incredibly overwhelming experience. And um, we had to prepare for that moment. And I thought long and hard about what I wanted to talk about. And I felt that really I had an obligation, a responsibility to talk about type 2 diabetes. And why did I want to talk about type 2 diabetes? Well, because I'm seeing more and more patients every year who are losing vision and going blind from type 2 diabetes. So one of the things I wanted to achieve this year is to raise awareness of the fact that type 2 diabetes is a blinding disease. Uh, there's probably in the order of 1.7 million people in Australia with, with diabetes. And over half of all of those people with diabetes uh, over half are not having their regular eye checks. And this is why it's become such a blinding problem in our society. It's now the leading cause of blindness amongst working age adults in this country. So the leading cause of blindness amongst our demographic, amongst my colleagues' demographic. And so what I'd like to do is encourage Australians with diabetes and, and people who have friends and family with diabetes to make sure they're having their regular eye checks. Across Australia, every day we're seeing in the order of 280 new cases of type 2 diabetes, which is quite staggering. And this is a really serious, uh, insidious disease with life-changing and life-threatening complications. It's a growing epidemic, which uh, globally has grown fourfold over the last 40 years. And in some communities in Australia, that's even more significant. In Aboriginal communities, for example, there's been an 80-fold increase in type 2 diabetes in the last 40 years. And there are some communities in Australia, Greater Western Sydney, for example, where uh, half of the adult population either have type 2 diabetes or pre what we call pre-diabetes. So I think it's really important. It's time for the public to be aware and it's a time for both business, industry and government to be accountable for uh, this growing uh, problem of sugar toxicity. Thank you very much, Dr. Muki. Thanks for your time today. Thank you very much, Sophie. Lovely to speak to you and uh, it was great to be a part of this.